Thank you very much for the introduction and welcome everyone. Today I would like to introduce the, the concept or the field of blue carbon. Uh, most probably most of you heard about, about it because it's been over the news and it's a field of research that has increased exponentially over the last decade or so. Uh, blue carbon ecosystems typically are the coastal vegetation, so they are primary producers that uh, they do photosynthesis and and they generate uh, biomass. Uh, here you have a mangrove ecosystem, a tidal marsh or salt marsh, then we have the seagrass meadows, and the algae, that's a, a new emerging blue carbon ecosystem that's being considered. We have others, so because it's a, it's a new field, it's, it's growing very fast as well, and for instance, people is arguing that the bones of whales can also constitute blue carbon, because end up in the deep ocean and the carbon is being sequestered, and also other coastal vegetation like the Malaluca or Casuarina forest that they are located in the supratidal area. However, my point of view here, it's quite clear, it's only autotrophic ecosystems that are the ones that we should uh, consider because they actually capture carbon through photosynthesis. This is a map of the global distribution of uh, these four blue carbon ecosystems. As you can see, they are mostly spread all over the world, only restricted to the coastal areas, but except the more cold regions, they are found all over the place. And mangroves focus mainly in the latitudinal or the, the equator region. Right, and so that's the point. So when you have an ecosystem that uh, fix more carbon that would consume, then it's, it's a natural, uh, natural carbon sink. And therefore, uh, we could consider that the excess of carbon fixed through photosynthesis that it's preserved uh, contributes to climate change mitigation, meaning that it's a, it's a sink, uh, a reservoir of carbon that contributes to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas uh, concentrations in the atmosphere. Also, as I will explain through the talk, it's not only about carbon. So as many other ecosystems like forest <coughs> or the oceans itself, they provide many other ecosystem services that contribute to our economy, to our lives and, and well-being. This is a very nice uh, range of pictures where it show that pretty much uh, blue carbon ecosystems, in this case, salt marshes and seagrasses, they act in the same way as, as forest, in the sense that there is uh, CO2 in the form of biomass captured within the, the canopies and the trees and the, and the leaves. But there another portion is captured within the, the soils underneath. The main difference between these two ecosystems is that uh, the main carbon pool in forest relies on the, on the biomass, on the living canopy, whereas the big portion in, in blue carbon ecosystems relies in the soil especially for tidal marsh and seagrass meadows that they have very short uh, canopies. And here is another illustration showing this phenomena. So these are the canopy of, of mangroves that resemble that, those of, of terrestrial forest in the sense that they have there are big trees and they have big biomass of carbon stored within the canopy. But then there are other components of the carbon pool like the dead biomass sitting on top of the seafloor or the soil, and the, and the below ground biomass as well that's living, and then on top the soil carbon, that in some cases can reach several meters in thickness, up to 10, 15 meters in thickness. So it's a massive pool. However, when we look at these ecosystems as a solution for climate change mitigation, and how we can manage to, to en enhance their carbon sequestration capacity, we have to consider also the turnover rates. So the living biomass, it has a resilience time uh, shorter than the soil carbon. And this is particularly important for seagrass and macroalgae and tidal marsh because they are year, either uh, yearly plants, so perennial plants that, that they last for a few years only, and therefore all the biomass is recycled, so it doesn't stay in the environment or sequestered for 
periods of time relevant to for, for climate change mit mitigation. That typically it's 50 to 100 years. However, in the, in the soil pool, that's also a big portion or the most of the ca total carbon pool in, in tidal marsh and sea grasses stays for centuries to millennia, constituting a really relevant carbon pool for climate change mitigation. And then besides what's accumulated within the habitat, uh, some of the carbon is exported beyond the, the boundaries of the habitat. And this is a very complex uh, field to study because of the spatial and temporal scales involved. So essentially this means that some of the primary production of these coastal vegetative ecosystems gets exported. Could be as dissolved organic carbon or particulate organic carbon and, or also the inorganic carbon, dissolved inorganic carbon. So maybe some of you work with the carbonate uh, system in the ocean and it's quite complex because within the carbonate system, some of these can end up emitted as CO2 in the atmosphere. Another could end up exported as total alkalinity, what we call it, and then end up sequestered in the, in the ocean, constituting a sink. Similarly, for the dissolved organic carbon and particulate organic carbon, the fate, it's, it's very complex to understand, but we know that a portion ends up sequestered in the deep ocean, either in the water column or in the deep sea sediments. There are only a few numbers around, around these processes, but it's certainly a, an emerging field of research that needs to be fulfilled in order to completely understand, so to have a, a holistic understanding of the global carbon cycle in, in coastal vegetated ecosystems. And then, uh, so the soils, all right, we arrived to these beautiful coastal habitats, but sometimes it's hard to see what's underneath. So I'd like to explain a, a little bit how, how it is. So essentially it's like a pit. It's like a, a pit land from terrestrial ecosystems composed of the plant debris, a mineral matrix, and then also multiple sources from sediment runoff from terrestrial environments or even from the plankton end up sequestered in these ecosystems. And then what happens? that the, the plant, in this case, uh, Posidonia meadow in the Balearic Islands, has to grow vertically in order to avoid burial and asphyxia. And therefore, it keeps accumulating and building up the soil substrate. So this is also a major difference compared to terrestrial ecosystems, when rather than a soil elevation and, and grow with time, you have an enrichment of carbon within the soil layer, except some, some exceptions. And then on top of it, these sediments also, or these coastal ecosystems, they are highly productive. So the net primary production rates are, are very high compared to other ecosystems. And then we have anoxia. So these are muddy sediments. There is no oxygen and therefore microbes, uh, metabolism is, is restricted. And then also we start to understand that the lignin, that is a, a component also found in, in the trunks of trees, it's very recalcitrant, so even if exposed to oxygen, it will stay there. And then this is kind of funny, but it's a reality. So we don't have fires underwater. And if you say, look, I am going to restore 100 hectares of a forest, for instance, in Australia, that it's very prone and exposed to fires. What we call the permanence, so the resilience of this project, of this carbon, is quite uncertain because from one day to another your carbon crediting or your carbon project could go to hell just because of a fire. However, I, also, I will explain, explain before, yes, no fires, but there are other risks in blue carbon ecosystems and they are mainly linked to, to climate change effects. And this is uh, how it looks like. So this was a sediment core collected in a seagrass meadow. And then you can see this is a pit type. So these are roots and, and parts of the plant rhizomes that they are highly preserved, preserved. But then when we look deeper in the sediment profile, so this is about 400, uh, four meters depth in the soil and about 4,000 years old material, 
we can also observe the, the walls of the, the cells that compose this seagrass fiber. So this highlights the exceptional preservation of, of this material. And then today I will focus on carbon, but I consider that it's important to, to explain that they are also biochemical sinks of many other elements. So this include, includes pollution, like nutrients or metals, and, and then also sediments. So in coastal areas, with all the, the development and all the building of infrastructure, uh, wastewater runoff, etc., we have many environmental issues. And in particular, seagrass, but also tidal marsh and mangroves and macroalgae, they constitute this belt, this filter of human impacts before reaching the ocean. And then following up on, on the previous presentation, they also form a, an environmental record that could be used to, to reconstruct the, the past. In this case, because of the changes in sea level rise, as Carmen was explaining, the seagrasses and coastal ecosystems have only been present along the shorelines nowadays for about 5,000 years. So that's the recent Holocene. And in some cases, this is a escarpment. So pretty much is erosion of the, of the meadow substrate that end up showing this beautiful wall uh, with all the ancient remains of, of the plant. And then let's dip uh, a bit more into the detail around blue carbon. So these are some key facts. Essentially, they only occupy a very narrow belt along our shorelines. But based on some estimates, they store about 50% of the ocean carbon in the seafloor. And then they are much more efficient in sequestering carbon dioxide than the rest of the forest. It's probably it's between 15 to 40 times uh, higher efficiency, but then consider that the area of blue car carbon ecosystem is two to three orders of magnitude lower than, than terrestrial forest. And then here is where we have the, the problem and the opportunity to act. So because of coastal development, uh, climate change, and other anthropogenic disturbances, we are losing these ecosystems. People like to live near the ocean, likes to have these houses, and then uh, these marinas with harbors and the boats, etc. So all these end up with the destruction of these coastal ecosystems. And maybe nowadays, because they are protected, because we are more conscious, there are these policies, it's not that apparent. But in the past, especially during 60s, 70s, uh, this was a major problem. And it continues to be in some parts of the Pacific and, and in developing countries that they are just developing their economies and mo sometimes the most efficient way just to chop down mangroves and run aquaculture for shrimps production, for example. And then, because all of this, uh, and because of the carbon credit market that results from the need to offset the emissions of these companies that they produce uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gas, but then based on the climate agreements, like Paris Agreement, they need to offset part of these emissions. So this means that there is funding, there is money to support the conservation and restoration of these ecosystems that based on, on a recent study, if we do a big effort to restore them, we can offset up to 3% of the global emissions and by 2030. And then there is these multiple co-benefits. I don't, I don't want you to leave just thinking that these ecosystems is only about blue carbon. So as, as, as forests and other uh, natural ecosystems, so they play a key role in climate regulation, but also they improve the water quality by uh, capturing and sequestering nutrients, pollutants. This could include uh, metals, but also uh, the particulate organic pollutants like that result from pesticides or also pathogens. So there is a study that shows that coastal ecosystems are very efficient in, in capturing these pathogens and sinking them in the soil so they are not uh, traveling around the environment. And then also because of the high uh, photosynthetic rates, the daily cycles in pH in seagrasses are much higher than those since the ocean acidification, so since the Industrial Revolution. 
they rank between 0.5 to 1 units of pH change, and they are called like uh, climate change refugia. And then uh, another important topic is the coastal protection. So, end of the day, in economic terms, what has uh, more value is its lives. And it's been demonstrated that mangroves and seagrass, macroalgae, etc., along the shorelines of tropical regions, for instance, when there are cyclones and hurricanes, they save life because there are this barrier in between the population and the ocean. And also they, they prevent the erosion of the shoreline, as I, as I will show in some case studies later on. Biodiversity. In the frame of the United Nations decade for the oceans, the 2021-2030, biodiversity and climate change, they are the key topics. And it's well known that these ecosystems are biodiversity hotspots. They support multiple species uh, of fauna and flora of all kingdoms. And then fisheries, when you think about, because sometimes we tend to look at the ecosystems as, as, as a use, no? as, as, so that they can provide to us. So in this sense, uh, there are nurseries for, for juvenile fish and other commercially interesting species like scallops. Same, same thing, one of the strategies that's being implemented in all around the world, it's to focus the tourism in, in, in the natural beauty. So instead of uh, developing economies around uh, other businesses, the, uh, uh, a cost-effective strategy, it's to just promote environmental tourism. And these coastal wetlands, because of their beauty, biodiversity, bird uh, habitats, etc., they constitute key areas for tourism and, and recreation. And the, and the food security, as I mentioned, uh, they are sources of food. Maybe now any of us would say, look, I live, or part, or half of my diet comes from a coastal wetland, but trust me, there are some regions around the world that they do. They, they harvest, uh, they, they live from, from the ocean and, and these coastal areas. And then when we talk about energy, so it's been discussed, uh, this particular relates to seaweed, because besides providing antibiotics and anti-cancerogens for or providing sources for, for these chemicals, they, they are being used as biofuels for jets, etc., that they are more environmentally friendly than, than fossil fuels. And then there are some explorations around the, the seagrass, probably when not in Barcelona, but when you go, for instance, up north in, in the coast of Girona, you will see some rock accumulated along the beaches. Some people consider it's nasty, it smells, it's not very nice, but end of the day, <laughs> the policy, the management in most areas, what happens is that there is a truck that picks it up in the morning so the tourists don't see it, and everyone is happy, probably except the fauna and, and all the food, food web that is supported by the degradation of, of this rock along the shorelines. So, in this sense, the bio rack, because, or the rack, sorry, because the fate typically is landfill, where it decomposes and emits heaps of uh, methane and other greenhouse gases, it's been discussed to use it as a, as a biochar, as a source of energy. And this is a, <coughs> a, a drawing that I really like. It kind of illustrates all, all this process so all these ecosystem services that, in this case, Seagrass Meadow provide in, in coastal areas. So it's about uh, carbon burial, a biodiversity refuge, then dissipate wave energy, so protecting uh, from coastal erosion. Then you have all this fauna and flora living within the meadow that they produce carbonates. So they are calcifying organisms that produce these carbonates. And if you look a bit from the outside, yes, carbonates, but they are biogenic sands. And the beaches, they are made of sands. So there is a role of, of seagrass and other coastal vegetated ecosystems as providing uh, habitat for organisms that produce sands, that nurse our coastline, and therefore also contribute to climate change adaptation against sea level and erosion. And this is a bit a bit of numbers, 
just to, it's very difficult to estimate the dollar value of an ecosystem because, I mean, there are no markets. That's number one. But then it's very, it's very complex. But for instance, because of these activities, bird watchers, fishing, etc., and, and tourism or even coastal constructions, so that the value could be of a few millions. And then around coastal potential, again, if you start saving lives, as I mentioned before, the, the value of the lives is it's very high. So as you can see, it's in the range of billions. And the fisheries, I mean, we all, we all know that the fisheries are probably under threat because it's been overfished for several decades. But still, if we keep these blue carbon ecosystems, we will preserve this nursery habitat for maintaining and maybe even enhancing uh, fisheries. Right, and then the Sustainable Development Goals. Have you, I believe that you all heard about it. It's within the United Nations program. So the, the idea here is that to do things to make a better planet for, for the people. And this, yes, applies to block carbon ecosystems, but essentially I would say that applies to any natural ecosystem, including forest and the deep ocean. So I listed here uh, all the SDGs where blue carbon ecosystems play a role. So they, the development, the conservation and restoration of, of these ecosystems provide jobs to people and provides even an, an industry around tourism and carbon credit markets. So this contributes to the no poverty and zero uh, hunger, then because of the, the co-benefits associated with blue carbon also good health and well-being. And then everything that has to do with making awareness to people of the need to preserve uh, the planet and the ecosystems. So this is a, a quality education and around the gender equity as well. So most people that work in, in these blue carbon ecosystems as a fisherman, or harvesting seaweed, for example, they, they are women. So it's very important as well that, to keep in mind that especially in developing countries, by promoting blue carbon ecosystems, we are actually supporting all, all these sustainable development goals. Right, so now this blue carbon, so probably now everyone knows about it, it's similar to the green carbon that applies uh, to the terrestrial ecosystems. But here a very brief story of how things evolved. Uh, since the Kyoto Protocol, the International Panel for Climate Change, etc., we know, most of us know that climate change is a, is, a pro is a problem that we have to face sooner or later. So people and, and politicians are moving forward to, to take action. Then we also know that there are uh, very relevant uh, carbon sinks worldwide and that they are at risk and their loss entails greenhouse gas emissions that they are uh, also important. Uh, now, uh, politicians, researchers, managers are trying to link the restoration of and conservation of blue carbon ecosystems to carbon markets. Why? Because this provides economic means to implement uh, these projects. But then, because of all the co-benefits, there is also the opportunity to link these conservation and restoration activities to other markets. There is a case, for example, in Queensland, in Australia, where there is a, a, a market around the nitrogen. So the deal is with the agriculture uh, and the farmers. So if they use uh, less nutrients, less nitrogen in, fo in phosphorus, because they use more efficient techniques, uh, more and, and plants to produce their crops, then the uh, Queensland government is paying them credits because at the end of the day, by reducing the nitrogen and phosphorus fluxes into the Queensland coastline and the Great Barrier Reef, that's the motor, or one of the main motors of the economy of, of the region, everything is it's much better, it's nicer, there is less mortality of corals, etc. So at the end of the day, it's like a chain of connect things that can, can be bring together uh, to create like uh, more economy or a stronger economy to support the conservation and management of, of blue carbon ecosystems. 
Right, I, discuss, I talk about a bit the threads, and uh, here <coughs> it's a diagram showing uh, most of them. As you can see, you have the more coastal development ones, industrial runoff, coastal infrastructure, and then we have the dredging as well, for instance, for maintaining the ports, shipping channels, and then there is some communities that they harvest directly these ecosystems, either for timber in, in in tidal marshes or seaweed for food. And then we have aquaculture as well, that it's been increasing exponentially over the last decades, and I will talk about it later on, but it's, it could be a massive issue uh, in the future around the coastal capacity for aquaculture farming in coastal areas. And then we have the, the threats linked to climate change. So marine heat waves, uh, extreme events like cyclones, hurricanes, droughts, ocean acidification, invasive species that some of them, for instance, they love eating seagrass and, and they just uh, go around and, and destroy the meadows, for example, or, or the macroalgae. And then I wanted to illustrate uh, this great picture that put the manifest, the, the problem with the anchors that we have here in the Mediterranean Sea. So I'm not sure if some of you spent time this summer or in the past around the coastline, but the boats, they anchor everywhere. And you should imagine uh, the, the boat as a, or the anchors of the boats and the chain as a mechanism of, I don't know the name in English, but when you prepare the land to farm, you know that you troll, and it's kind of dragging this, this carbon all along. Start to be some regulations, but with this summer we did a study here in Cap de Creus, and it, it was insane. I mean, there are boats all over the place, and you know they drop the anchor, and then even if there is no wind, they just reverse to hold it properly in place and things like that. And then when they retrieve it, rather than you know uh, driving forward and getting the vertical, no, they just press the bottom, the retrieving, and they just drag everything. So it was pretty amazed to, to see the impact per unit area. And yeah, so the politicians are moving forward with all this environmental threat. And hopefully in the near future, we will see more environmentally friendly moorings around the coast and, and a strong law with fines and, and implementation to, to protect the habitats. And then you have to start to imagine uh, for the next portion of the talk, how it will like uh, the landscape or the coastal area and the different management scenarios. So this would be the, the natural condition with all the vegetation, including uh, plankton, seagrass, macroalgae, mangroves, tidal marsh, a healthy ecosystem. So this is well understood that it's a, a greenhouse gas sink. But then when you start running all these activities, pretty much you destroy the habitat and and then the greenhouse gas activity uh, emissions are much higher. When I talk about greenhouse gas, I am talking about carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrox oxide. So there are three main greenhouse gases. Right, so the term blue carbon originated recently, around uh, 2000, but the concept of the macrophytes, the coastal or the marine macrophytes constituting a, a net or important sink in the planet, are, uh, came from an early work by Smith in 1981, where he placed marine macrophytes among the other main natural carbon sinks on Earth, like or, or carbon-fixing ecosystems on Earth. Plankton, terrestrial, and all these are different types of, of forest. And as you can see, marine macrophytes sits, yes, lower, but in terms of total pr primary production, biomass, and global primary production, they sit quite, quite there in the middle, lower, but in the middle. And since there, there's been uh, plenty of research looking at which, what we should consider or embed within blue carbon habitats, and then involved multiple uh, disciplines. Some biogeochemical science, uh, conservation and management, economics, policy, and law, because all the carbon ca market uh, mechanisms, they, they are rigid and they are supported by different laws. So there was a need to, to involve all these stakeholders 
to get something in place, to get something, something uh, useful for carbon accounting. And this figure illustrates how this field of research, blue carbon, increased exponentially. It's one of the fields that increased at higher rates uh, over the last decade. And this is illustrated by the total or the cumulative number of publications per year until 2021. And this is a bit of a timeline of the, diff or the key events that uh, promoted blue carbon science and policy. First of all, there was a recognition that the oceans are global or globally relevant carbon sinks. Then people around the 80s start worrying about climate change. Mm, we start seeing some negative effects and there was a, a conference in Geneva. Then there was this initial paper uh, in 1991 that put marine macrophytes in, in, the, in the picture. Then there was the formation of, of the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change in 1988, and the United uh, Nations Framework or Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, that you may have heard about. So the political agenda at, at a global scale was moving forward towards doing something to mitigate climate change effect. Kyoto Protocol, and a few estimates of the global role of these blue carbon ecosystems in, in climate change mitigation and adaptation. And then when we move from here, here it's the first item where the blue carbon ecosystems were included in the IPCC as a mechanism to mitigate climate change. And then there was this recent agreement in Paris in 2016, where most nations committed to reduce emissions by 2030 and 2050. And then, as I will explain later on, beyond or, or behind all this carbon crediting and carbon fluxes, there is these standard methodologies. So essentially, you have to follow a specific method to be able to demonstrate that your activity, your project, is making a difference. So it's actually resulting in enhanced carbon sequestration or avoided greenhouse gas emissions. So in order to uh, claim and demonstrate these carbon credits for accounting, you need actually to, to adhere to these methodologies. And in this sense, in this Paris uh, Agreement, uh, countries were asked whether they would like, they would like to include or, or, or to join the, the agreement. And then after, there is this uh, mechanism that is called a nationally determined contributions towards climate change uh, mitigation. So the countries need to decide which actions they will take to actually reduce emissions. And they have to do it every five years as, as a reporting mechanism. And to date, about 46 countries already included blue carbon ecosystems in this, or as a portfolio of mechanisms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then in terms of blue carbon projects, there are, there are several. There are more than 10 and more than 20 running at the moment. And these are some examples. Australia is kind of pioneering. And then they are not all, so don't take this as, as the absolute number. But as you can see, they start to spread around the world. This region of you know, Southeast Asia will be quite prominent for blue carbon projects because mainly the Europe and America, et cetera, will invest in these developing countries to protect their ecosystems. It's cheaper labor, and they're actually under higher risk and threat than, than in, in the North America or Europe, etc. Right, and then I would like to show you a few kinds of studies, examples of, of what happened. South of Spain, in Huelva, there is this very ancient port that's been using since, I don't know, 4,000 years or more. It's a metallurgic area, so they are mining for metals and ores. And then the tidal marshes in this region went, were quite destroy, destroyed. So they decided to take action. They planted, uh, they used seedlings of Spartina. That's a, a very common uh, salt marsh species. And they started revegetation the shorelines of the, of the estuary mouth. And then this uh, resulted in the stabilization of the Estorian coastline. 
So before it was being eroded, now it's, it's settled, it's fixed. So less money to be spent in, in building uh, groins and other coastal contractions to avoid the, the uh, seawater intrusion into the coastal wetlands and then all together with the visit other ecological functions. And it's estimating that annually this small new ecosystem is capturing about 300 tons of, of carbon a year. Uh, another, I, so I forgot to mention that there was a Life Blue Natura, so a European project that developed uh, methodologies to register this project in the Spanish uh, national uh, crediting system. So it's actually underway. It's being implemented as a blue carbon project. And then in the US, in Virginia, so, uh, right, so <laughs> the Americans like to, to make things big. So in this case, uh, there was a, a hurricane and a disease that killed all the seagrass, so stera species, that was living in the area. And then uh, they start taking seeds. Zostera is kind of a grass, so you, you have plenty of seeds every year, you can harvest them. There is also a restaurant here in, in the south that uses them uh, in the cuisine, like similar to rice. So what they did is collect these seeds and they start planting them. They just throw them in the water in a specific areas and they, they start restoring bits and pieces. As you can see here, the, the colored area is the growing extent of, of the meadow over time. And I don't know, they managed to recover 36 square kilometers of the meadows. That's, that's a massive area. Imagine that you walk 36 kilometers one way and turn right, another 36 kilometer and keep going. So it's a massive area. And this actually is the first seagrass project that's been registered under the American carbon crediting system. And it, it will run for 30 to 40 years for the verification process. And then it's also been estimated that this new ecosystem is generating millions of dollar benefit per year. Another case study, it's, it's in Queensland, where they, so the coastal wetlands, they're, they're very productive, right? It's the best, one of the best grounds to, to farm. And what used to happen in the 60s is that they drain them. So they create a wall that restricts the tidal flow and then they could use the, the land to grow the crops. So here's what they did. They start producing the sugar cane, that it's very popular and very economically uh, profitable. And then this resulted in the dry off of the land and the creation of sulfate salts, acid sulfate salts. So there are very acidic salts resulting from the uh, microbial activity. But then since then, they introduced in 2000, they introduced the tidal flow, and now it's uh, in a much better shape, it's recovering. However, they did not study the blue carbon benefits associated. Uh, can you please, good time is it now? 10 minutes. <laughs> right, so this is my holistic overview of how this blue carbon project should be. We should not focus in a single ecosystem, not in a single activity, neither in a single region. So the methodologies that currently it's not possible to do, they should account for all these multiple projects occurring at the same time within the coastal area. From the introduction of tidal flow to, regener to promote the, the flooding and regeneration of tidal marshes and mangroves, farming of seaweed in the coastal areas, so it can be harvested, and then depending on the fate of the seaweed, there will be more or less carbon sequestration, but for instance, the exported portion will, will be there. Reforestate the lost habitats, uh, shut down the aquaculture farming, because it's the, probably the more easiest way for them to, to, produce, to make money, but there are other uh, options, economical alternatives restore seagrass, uh, sea uh, manage the rock, create man mangroves where before they were not present, so you can modify the aerodynamics. Uh, the grazers, they also known to devastate seagrass and tidal marshes, so 
if the cattle raising is controlled and we keep the areas more or less clean of grazers, then this could be claimed as well as a, as a carbon sequestration mechanism. Here, uh, some boring numbers, just to have an idea, they're a bit meaningless at the moment. But yeah, this is a global estimate of blue carbon stocks around the world. Just to point that they are, even recently, they are being lost at high rates. So it could be up to 2% for tidal marsh of habitat extent a year. These estimates are a bit uh, difficult to, to obtain, but essentially we are still losing these ecosystems. But in big numbers is that we have about uh, 30,000 teragrams of carbon across 185 million hectares. That the conservation of and restoration of, of these ecosystems could provide a big number in teragrams of avoided emissions. And I don't know, if you take these values here as 3% of global emissions, you can say that this would be a equivalent to about 1.5% of global emissions and this I don't know, this it's difficult, 300. Yeah, about 50% of global emissions, this value here. So look, there is no secret here. We have to stop burning fossil fuels and stop emissions. Otherwise, this is not the panacea of, of the solution to climate change, but it's a small contribution, keeping in mind that there are also multiple other co-benefits. And essentially, the other issue is it's if this restoration of this ecosystem is econ economically sustainable or not. We start learning <coughs> how, but when you go to an investor, a philanthropic or a company, and you, you sell a blue carbon project, they say that it's less attractive in some, some way because it's, it's more complex, the benefits are, take too long to obtain, up to 30 years. Then there are issues, political issues, who, who is the owner of the land, who is the owner of the sea? So it's not a farmer normally. It's the government, etc. And then <coughs> the techniques for restoration, they're also complex. It's more difficult to grow seagrass than, than a crop. And in terms of the carbon credits, one could claim the enhanced sequestration. So what you are doing to make the ecosystem to sequester more carbon, and then the avoided emissions. So what you are doing to restrict microbial attack and reduce the emissions of CO2 and other green, green gas gases to the environment. And there are some that they, they are forever, others that it can take years to decades. So blue carbon projects run for 30 years or more, and others they are immediate. So if you avoid cutting the mangroves for timber, then you can claim the emissions directly. And then it's always the same thing. So what's the cost of protection and project implementation versus the market of value of the carbon? So in this sense, as a very simplistic way to see it, if you have a cost of protection and project implementation, that's the red line, and then you have the benefits linked to carbon sequestration or other ecosystem services, when these lines cross the red, so that is when you have a net benefit. If you are below, the costs are bigger than the, than the benefits. And then when you have to certify and finance the project, so you have two types of of carbon markets, the compliance ones, that they are regulated by big organizations internationally or regionally. A uh, few examples uh, here. And then the voluntary market. So these are not a regulation for other uh, small companies and things, and they are typically run for small scale pro projects and the cost of implementation are, are lower. And then, so the credits do not belong to the, let's call it the, the government or the institutions, rather to uh, the, the investors who create the project, that then they can sell it uh, to industries or in the individuals on a voluntary basis. Then, this is a bit boring, so it's not like the Volotin Oficial del Estado, but pretty much. So it's the standards. You have to read these 40, 100 pages with a mix of ecological, policy, law, information there that you have somehow to digest to set up uh, your project following the, the, sta the standard. Here are a few, a few uh, methodologies that have been running for a while. 
and there are a few blue carbon projects. And then in terms of the, the, the cost or the price of a ton of CO2 equivalent, so a ton of, of carbon, it varies a lot. Typically the blue carbon uh, credits are more expensive than the other ones, so that's why you have this very low variability. And the blue carbon ones, because of the cost of implementation, complexity of the certification, etc., typically they are valued higher. And then <coughs> I mentioned before that there are no fires in the water, but you have environmental uh, threats. For instance, climate change with the sea level rise, herbivory, and heat waves, they are killing this seagrass, mangroves, and tidal marsh. There is a big example in the Carpentaria Gulf in the Northern Territory of Australia, where 1,000 square kilometers of mangrove die off because of a combination of a drop of sea level, increase of soil salinity, and very high, due to very high uh, temperatures and, and evaporation that just killed 1,000 square kilometers of of the mangroves. And then we have the socioeconomic. So there is competition for for using the coastline. So what's more profitable, what we want to do. So it's going to be a, a competition down the track. Then seaweed aquaculture is limited by nut nutrients. We don't know negative, the, neg the potential negative ecological consequences if we scale it up uh, around, the, around the wall. And then even if we protect and conserve this ecosystem, the funding to run effectively the management of these marine protected areas normally is limited, so not effective. I will pass this very quick, but we don't know, there are many things that we don't know yet about blue carbon ecosystems. One of them is the variability, so within a small spatial scale, some store a lot, others very little. The mapping so we don't know still, we don't know how much seagrass there is around the world. The uncertainties are, are very big. And then what are the fluxes in these ecosystems, including within the ecosystem and beyond? There are some caveats in there as well. And where it goes, this carbon when it gets exported, we don't, we don't really know. The calcium carbonate question is a bit complex as well because carbonate production entails uh, CO2 emissions, while carbonate dissolution entails CO2 sequestration. It's a bit complex, but even if it's carbon, it's inorganic, and this generates emissions. So it's something that we need to sort out, sort out somehow, and include in these carbon uh, assessments. And the, the risk of permanence of the carbon as well, against climate change threats. And this is my view of how the blue carbon should evolve in the future. So first of all, we all, meaning all countries, should commit to include blue carbon ecosystems in national determined contributions and any other ecosystems just because of, of their beauty. We need to develop new methods and verification schemes, schemes that they are easy going, and they encompass all types of activities and, and habitats within a region. We need to restore using uh, effective methods, including the use of genotypes of plant species that they are resistant or re resilient to climate change. We have to do a bit more of research on greenhouse gas fluxes, mainly methane and nitrous oxide. And then we need to develop new markets, biodiversity, nutrients, pollution, tourism, etc. We need more economic support to, to implement this this blue carbon restoration. I would like to finish with a nice picture of a seagrass escarpment from Enrique Ballesteros. And I would like also to mention that Enrique Quique yeah, is a former PhD student of uh, Ramon Margalef that gives honor to this symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. That was great.